Uh, good morning and welcome everyone to today's TVD webinar. Uh, we'll have two excellent speakers today, uh, Dr. Benika Pinch and Dr. Seth uh, Carboneau, uh, with exciting talks combining coffee with Tegran tags and the CAR T therapy. So, uh, what, what's not to like about it? I think there's, there's something for everybody. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Benika Pinch. Uh, Benika will be talking about a, a strategy to assess uh, cellular activity of each of these components. Um, against neosubstrates using electrophilic probes. Uh, Benika has, is a principal scientist at Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research, uh, where her research is focused on applying chemical biology to exploring drug discovery projects. And she received her BA in biochemistry and master's in chemistry from University of Pennsylvania in 2014, and her PhD in chemical biology from Harvard University in 2019. At Harvard, she worked closely with Dr. Nathaniel's grade lab actually in Dr. Nathaniel's Gray's lab, uh, characterizing bifunctional kinase degraders and developing covalent uh, chemical probes. Um, so we'll start with Benika and then um, move to uh, Seth halfway through the talk and feel free to ask any questions through the Q&A panel um, as, as you go. Um, welcome back, Benika, and I'm super excited for this talk. Um, take it away, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you so much for that introduction and, and thanks for the invitation to speak today. Um, I've been a really big fan of this webinar, so it's really exciting to have this opportunity to participate. Um, and as was introduced, I'll be sharing a method that we developed at Novartis to assess the degradation activity of E3s against neosubstrates. And we called this method COFFEE, uh, which stands for covalent functionalization followed by E3 electroporation. And so today I'll be showing applications of this method to several members of the Kellen ring ligase family, which is the largest family of E3s. And all of these E3 ligases share the common characteristic that they have a modular architecture uh, consisting of the Cullen scaffolding protein, a ring finger protein, which will recruit a ubiquitin charged E2, and then on the other end of the colon, an adapter, which mediates interactions with the substrate receptor, which will then position the substrate in proximity to the E2 for efficient ubiquitin transfer. And then ultimately, the ubiquitinated substrate will be shuttled to the proteasome for degradation. And as was shown in a really nice study led by Eric Fisher in the Tama lab in 2011, this modular architecture of the Cullen ring ligase family can enable a lot of rotational mobility along the Cullen arm, giving rise to quite a wide and flexible ubiquitination zone. And as many groups have shown at this point, uh, E3 ligase receptors within this family in particular targeted protein degradation using molecular glues uh, or bifunctional degraders. Uh, Benika, I think we may have lost your uh, your uh, screen sharing, if you wouldn't mind sharing the screen again. Oh, sure. Let's see. That's strange. Can you see it now? Um, no, not on my screen on this. All right, let's see. Yeah. Yeah, Zoom, Zoom sometimes is not, uh, I mean, this kind of thing. <laughs> Looks like I got disconnected for a second. Oh, Let's try yeah. again. Yeah, please. Go Sorry ahead. about that. Now we can see your full screen. Okay, perfect. Thank How you. does that look? Okay, perfect. Oh, Let me perfect. know. Hopefully that doesn't happen again, but. Yeah, mm -hmm. we'll see. Um, so yeah, beyond uh, Cerebron and VHL, there are hundreds of additional E3 ligases that could potentially be redirected for targeted protein degradation. And some of the advantages of expanding our TPD toolkit are first, if we can uh, redirect E3 ligases that have tissue or disease specific or enriched expression, um, we could potentially achieve really selective degradation within the specific disease cellular context. Also, it's been quite well documented that loss of cerebron is a common resistance mechanism for cerebron mediated degraders. And so harnessing essential E3 ligases could present a means of overcoming those types of resistance mechanisms. 
Uh, and finally, harnessing additional E3 ligases could expand the landscape of targets that were able to degrade. Uh, so for instance, in a really nice study led by Catherine Donovan and Fleur Ferguson here at DFCI, uh, they showed that by when they link a promiscuous kinase inhibitor to ligands recruiting either VHL or Cerebron, that there were differences in the kinases degraded by each E3 ligase. And so uh, the question that we wanted to answer was with these hundreds of potential E3 ligases, how can we fast track the selection of new E3s for TPD? And so to answer this, we developed uh, essentially a shortcut method that we could use to assess the activity of E3s against neosubstrates in order to de-risk subsequent E3 ligand finding efforts. And so previously, this question of E3 activity against neosubstrates has generally been answered in one of two ways. Uh, the first being using genetic approaches. So for instance, what's shown on the upper left here is a study from the Cruz lab showing that if you express a fusion protein of your E3 of interest with a halo tag, um, you can then test to see whether it's able to degrade GFP tagged FKBP12 uh, following treatment with bifunctionals that both engage FKBP and have a halo tag to engage the, uh, have a chloroalkane tail to engage the halo tag. Uh, the second approach is actually to identify ligands for your E3 of interest and then to extend those into bifunctional degraders and to test whether they work. Uh, this, of course, can be pretty resource intensive, requiring maybe high throughput screening or structure based design. And so our goal was for this method to really um, be able to use an untagged E3 ligase component without the need for gen genetic manipulation or specific E3 binding ligands. And so to do this, we wanted to take advantage of the fact that ma the majority of E3 ligases contain reactive cysteines. Uh, and this was really nicely summarized in a recent review from Dan Namura's lab where they mined their chemoproteomics data sets and found that as many as 97% of E3 ligases have reactive cysteines that can be labeled with electrophiles. In the same review, they also um, summarized the work in recent years to develop covalent E3 ligase recruiters coming out of the Namura and Cravat labs, which really further showcases the tractability of a covalent approach for this class of proteins. However, we didn't want to develop a specific covalent ligand for every E3 ligase that we might be interested in. And so instead, what we opted to do was to take a very generic electrophile, a malamid, which would label any E3 ligase so long as it has surface exposed ligandable cysteines. Uh, but of course, a malamid won't be selective within a cellular context. Uh, and so we need to do the actual labeling event on the level of purified recombinant protein. And so what we envisioned doing was to take our purified E3 ligase to label it directly with a neosubstrate ligand using a malamid functionalized probe. Uh, so JQ1, the BRD4 ligand, is shown here as an example. And we can easily monitor that labeling event by intact mass spec. And so we then want to assess the degradation activity of this functionalized E3. And so to do that, we need to get it into cells, which we can do by electroporating cells to temporarily permeabilize the membrane so that they'll take up that neosubstrate functionalized E3. It can then associate with the remaining components of the E3 ligase complex, leading then to ubiquitination and degradation of the neosubstrate. In this case, it would be BRD4. And we can read out that degradation uh, event by Western blot or even by proteomics. And so this is a general setup for coffee, the covalent functionalization, followed by electroporation into cells. Uh, but before actually attempting this, we first wanted to ask the more fundamental question of are electroporated E3 ligases actually functional? And there have been some really nice studies in the literature showing that electroporated proteins are generally functional. They maintain native uh, localization and interaction with other proteins, but this had not been looked at specifically for E3 ligases. And so we turned to VHL as a proof of concept system. Um, we expressed VHL in complex with the Cullen 2 adapter proteins along B and C. And this is because um, those, those adapters are required for VHL protein stability. And we wanted to see if we took VHL ELO BC and electroporated in, it into cells, did it associate with the remaining components of the Cullen 2 ring ligase complex? 
And so we did a pull down experiment in 7860 cells, which are VHL null. So we electroprated in either buffer, biotinylated VHL, or a non biotinylated VHL control. Uh, and as you can see on the left here in the input, we can really uh, nicely track the success of the electroporation by blotting for VHL itself. And what we found was that after pulling down biotinylated VHL on streptavidin and agarose, we also successfully pulled down colon 2 and RBX1, so indicating that the electroprated protein was successfully assembled into the complex. But we then wanted to ask, um, is the complex actually functional? And so for VHL, we wondered, is it able to degrade its endogenous target, HIF2-alpha? And so we again electroprated it into 7860 cells using negative controls like buffer alone and BSA as just an unrelated protein. And we saw that electroprated VHL led to a very stark decrease in levels of HIF2 alpha, actually bringing HIF2 levels down to what we see um, on the far right here in a control cell line in which we've re-expressed VHL from a lentiviral vector. And so together, this really indicated to us that yes, electroporated uh, E3 ligases are in fact functional. And so we then wanted to try an actual coffee experiment. And so to select our first proof of concept ligase for this approach, um, we rank ordered all of the annotated E3 ligases by um, minimum total number of cysteines. And we did this with the rationale that if an E3 has fewer total cysteines, we might have a better chance of achieving single labeling rather than having multiple labeling events with our malamid probe. And at the top of this list was VHL with just two cysteines. Uh, one of those cysteines, cysteine 162, is uh, buried at the elongan C binding interface, while the other, cysteine 77, is solvent exposed and adjacent to the native HIF binding pocket. And so with this just one surface exposed cysteine, VHL really provided an ideal proof of concept system for us. Um, however, I did mention that VHL protein needs to be co-expressed with the elongans in order to be stable. Uh, elongan B does also have a surface exposed cysteine, cysteine 89. And so we express the complex with that cysteine mutated to a serine in order to really make sure we are achieving selective labeling of VHL. And so we next labeled VHL with JQ1 using this compound one shown here, malamid functionalized JQ1. And we were able to achieve essentially 100% single labeling of VHL, which we monitored by intact mass spec. So what's shown on the bottom left is the spectrum for unlabeled VHL in blue, overlaid with that for JQ1 labeled VHL in green. And we next then took our JQ1 VHL conjugate and electroprated it into hex cells, again using various negative controls like the unlabeled ligase, as well as a BSA JQ1 conjugate to just control for any compound effects. And we were really excited to see that in a dose-dependent manner, the VHL JQ1 conjugate led to a reduction in levels of BRD4. And we also confirmed that this degradation we were seeing was acting by the expected mechanism in that if we pretreated cells before the electroporation with either a proteasome inhibitor or a nitylation inhibitor to block Cullen function or an excess of JQ1 to block BRD4 engagement, in all cases, we completely rescued the observed degradation. So this was the really exciting first indication for us that this approach uh, actually works. Uh, but we know with targeted protein degradation, that successful degradation is very dependent on things like linker length and target ligase pairing. And so we next wanted to extend this approach to additional neosubstrates. And so to do this, we synthesized a malamid functionalized disatinib probe shown here, with disatinib being the multi-tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And we also made a corresponding negative control probe where we methylated the nitrogen at the kinase hinge binding uh, region so that it can no longer engage its kinase targets. And what we saw following electroporation was again a dose dependent degradation of various disatinib targets. Here we were tracking uh, ABLE, CSK, and LIN with no corresponding degradation by the methylated negative control conjugate shown on the far right. But disatinib engages many more kinases beyond just these three. So we did also collect cells for proteomics following electroporation. And there we could see degradation of many disatinib targets highlighted here with the orange dots. 
So these studies with VHL really helped us uh, lay the groundwork for this approach, but ultimately we were interested in applying coffee to an E3 ligase that had not previously been redirected for TPD. And so we selected another Cullen ring ligase receptor to try this on, SVSB2, which is an E3 that does have validated degradation activity against its endogenous substrate, INOS, or inducible nitric oxide synthase. Um, however, it hasn't previously been redirected to degrade neosubstrates. And SBSV2 has four cysteines, um, and by playing with the stoichiometry of the labeling, we were able to get just single labeling of the cysteine highlighted here, cysteine 53, which is adjacent to the native substrate interaction pocket on SBSV2, shown here bound by a macrocyclic peptide inhibitor. And after electroporating this dasatinib conjugated SBSB2 into cells, we saw around 50% reduction in levels of CSK and LIN, with again, no corresponding degradation by the methylated negative control. So an exciting first indication that this ligase can also be redirected to degrade neosubstrates. And so next we were interested in applying this approach to adapter proteins within the Cullen ring ligase family. Um, and so again, these are the proteins that mediate the interaction between the Cullen and the corresponding substrate receptor. So for Cullen 1, the adapter is skip 1, for Cullens 2 and 5, along it's B and C, and then for Cullen 4, the adapter is DDB1. And we were interested in this family because in general, adapters are expressed at much higher levels than substrate receptors. This is what's illustrated here on the right, um, some GTEx mining data showing the average expression of adapter proteins in green versus uh, some representative substrate receptors shown in red. And also adapter proteins are um, essential proteins and so loss of an adapter wouldn't necessarily be an expected resistance mechanism. Also, uh, just last year, there were three really exciting papers published showing that the Cullen 4 adapter, DDB1, can be redirected using molecular glues to degrade cyclin K. And what was really interesting in all of these cases is that the molecular glues were recruiting cyclin K's binding partner, CDK12, to DDB1, essentially turning it into a type of neosubstrate receptor where cyclin K was then positioned in proximity to the E2 for degradation. And so we were curious whether adapter proteins could be directly redirected for targeted protein degradation, even in the absence of any form of substrate receptor. And so looking to apply coffee within this family, uh, SKIP1 has three total cysteines, and we found that two of those were ligandable. So we ended up with double labeled SKIP1 protein for our electroporation. Alongin B, I mentioned, has one ligandable cysteine, cysteine 89. And along in C, while it has three total cysteines, we found that none of them were actually ligandable. And then DDB1 has many more cysteines, so we actually didn't attempt labeling of that adapter. And so what we found was that uh, electroporated desatinib skip one did lead to reduction in LIN kinase levels, which we did not observe with the methylated negative control. We didn't see any degradation mediated by along and B desatinib for the three kinases that we were tracking in this Western. And what was interesting was that the two cysteines that we're labeling on SKIP1, um, cysteine-120 and cysteine-160, are actually oriented towards the face where normally the substrate receptor would bind. Uh, and so suggesting that these cysteines might be unique, uniquely well positioned for actually um, recruiting in a neosubstrate for degradation. And so to summarize um, some considerations for this approach are, first of all, that it does, of course, require access to purified recombinant protein. Uh, it's also very important that labeling of the cysteine doesn't disrupt protein folding or interactions with the ubiquitination machinery. Also, if a protein has multiple or no ligandable cysteines, it would then be necessary to engineer, um, for instance, monocysteine mutants in order to really specifically label particular sites. Uh, and also with this approach, we really don't read too much into negative results. For instance, um, the along and B result that I showed on the previous slide, because there are so many factors that go into successful degradation, like linker length and target ligase pairing. And so we don't see a negative result as ruling a, an E3 unhijackable. Rather, we use positive results to um, really prioritize E3 ligases that we then know can degrade a target we're interested in.
And so the utility here is again, quick validation of the hijackability of an E3 against a target that you're interested in. This can be done for any target of interest so long as you have um, a ligand and know an exit vector so that you can make the malamid probe. Um, and also thinking about covalent bifunctional degraders with covalency on the E3 end, um, this approach is really directly extensible to those degraders since you're directly validating a particular cysteine for TPD. But also thinking more generally, depending on the position of the cysteine, you can validate particular pockets or faces of an E3 ligase for recruitment. Um, and so that's something we're particularly excited about with this approach that by testing um, monocysteine mutants, you can enable a really high level of resolution to really probe different orientation requirements for uh, targeted protein degradation. And so with that, I wanna thank um, everyone at Novartis who really uh, enabled this project. In particular, thanks to Claudio Toma, Lynn McGregor, Dustin Davala, and Bill Forrester. I also wanna give out a shout out to the um, Harvard Thera Therapeutics Program. This project was initiated actually uh, while I was an intern along with Edward Harvey and Zach Hausman while we were finishing our PhDs at Harvard. And so a big thank you to that program and in particular to Catherine DeBroy who um, really enabled that internship for us. And thanks again to all the um, hosts of this series for putting on such a fun webinar. Um, and in particular, thanks again to Radek for the uh, invitation. And if you're curious to read more, this was published um, just last month in Cell Chemical Biology. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, Seth is uh, is a principal scientist uh, at at Nibir and also has experience at, at Dana Farber. So Dr. Seth uh, uh, Carbona will be talking about uh, image inducible diagrams to reversibly regulate uh, CAR T therapy. Um, Seth is a graduate of a College of the Atlantic in Bar Arbor in Maine and has worked with Dr. James Kaufman at the Mount Desert Island Biological laboratory and with Dr. Thomas Luke at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and is now based at Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research uh, where he focuses in the fields of developmental biology and uh, genetics, uh, chemical biology and, and assay technologies including targeted protein degradation and exploratory drug discovery. It's really great to have you uh, talk set and then uh, please go ahead, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for thanks for the invite to this uh, this great seminar. I've been following it for a while and it's nice to have a homecoming coming back to Dana Farber, uh, at least virtually. And also I'd like to thank Benica uh, for sharing this slot with me. Um, so uh, let's see. Yeah, so just uh, quick disclosures that I'm actively employed by Novartis and I'm a co-inventor on uh, patent related to this technology as well. Um, so in 2012, uh, then seven-year-old uh, cancer patient Emily Whitehead was told that her, uh, that her ALL had relapsed after 16 months of really intensive chemotherapy. And so, um, you know, her parents were informed that she likely wouldn't survive. But, you know, to really determine to save their daughter, her parents enrolled her in a clinical trial for a new immunotherapy uh, chimeric antigen receptor uh, T-cell therapy or CART therapy. Um, for two weeks, she experienced incredibly high fevers and, and was on a ventilator, but due to the cytokine storm um, that was in her body just from her immune system fighting off uh, her, her tumor cells. But within a month, she was declared cancer-free and now um, she's been cancer-free for nine years. And so this therapy now known <clears throat> as Camraya and, uh, you know, CAR therapy, there's, there's um, other, uh, others besides Camraya that are also uh, FDA approved. It's a trans transformative medicine that really helps patients, uh, in this case, for pediatric and adult uh, patients with uh, B-cell cancers. And so CAR therapy is a, it's an ex vivo gene therapy. And so, you know, what this means is that actually uh, patient cells are extracted from their body. In this case, uh, white blood cells, including T cells um, are isolated and they're infected with, uh, with a inactive lentivirus that, uh, that um, transduces the cells to express um, uh, genetically encoded um, 
receptor that recognizes um, that recognizes tumor tumor specific tumor antigens. Um, these cells are then uh, expanded uh, ex vivo and then packaged and delivered back to the hospital and then um, and then given uh, put back into the patients uh, where the cell um, where where the cells then um, really just attack the tumor cells. And the, the way that the, the cards are essentially composed of a single chain variable fragment, um, which is uh, affinity matured to specifically bind to a cancer cell surface marker. Um, in the case of, in this case, CTL019 or Kimbraya, um, this is tethered to an intracellular co-stimulatory and, acti and, co and activation domains. Um, and so essentially, you know, there is, yeah, now that, you know, I've kind of explained what, uh, what CARTs are, there's, and of course, that they're incredibly efficacious, um, you know, there, there's also potential needs to, to regulate CARTs. And so um, once they're put back in the, in the body, they're theoretically there for life. Um, and there's, you know, many unwanted side effects, um, you know, one of which is uh, cytokine release syndrome, just based on the large amounts of cytokines that are, that are produced by the immune system um, after uh, and during tumor lysis. And this is also associated with neurological um, toxicities. Um, and then there's, of course, you know, also other toxicities such as those that are on target, um, but off tumor. Um, and so in the case of Kimraya, this is actually can cause B cell aplasia because B cells also express CD19 on their surface. Um, and so this can lead CARTs to attack, um, to attack B cells as well. Um, and since CARTs are genetically programmed, they can also uh, be programmed to be regulated. And so, you know, this has been done many, you know, with, with different types of on switches, off switches, or even kill switches to kill, um, to kill CARTs. Essentially, you know, when we originally started this project, we aimed to develop a tunable and reversible off switch to be able to regulate CARTs only when needed. Um, and, of, and when we started this, there wasn't an approved um, therapy for, uh, to, to mitigate cytokine release syndrome and associated neurotoxicities. Um, since then, um, because yeah, and I, I guess I should mention that these are these are also pretty these occur at pretty high rates in patients as well, um, because it is you know also potentially associated with the efficacy of of, of the therapy, um, and so um, so now these actually uh, at least um, for Kim Raya and others anti IL six uh, toxalizumab treatment um, and corticosteroids is actually very uh, efficacious at reducing these, these symptoms. Um, but this doesn't mean that there's not, um, there's not a need for regulatable CARs because, you know, as we, you know, this is a very, uh, a, a very fast growing field and uh, there will be, you know, more CARs approved and there may be a need to regulate CARs um, for, you um, for purposes of you know alternate alternate manufacturing or and or designs that could you know cause more potent carts uh, or new cars uh, for new disease indications uh, or patient populations, um, as well as you know there's also a lot of increasing data showing that cart therapy in patients with high tumor burden can actually lead to T cell exhaustion. Um, and uh, and uh, this can also be. There, this could actually potentially regulation um, could re could uh, potentially prevent this from occurring, um, and so when we initially started thinking uh, about how we would want to regulate carts with an off switch, a tunable off switch, we really thought you know we'd take a chemical biology approach to to solve the this problem, and Degron tags really seem like ideal off switches. I mean, of course, there's many potential options here. And so just to cover a few, you know, I think one of the things we were really focused on was utilizing a very small human peptide. So we'd have mini minimal immunogenicity risk uh, while also ideally uh, being able to be paired with a molecule that had good MedCamp properties and was ideally FDA approved. So this could actually potentially move a lot faster towards the clinic if needed. Um, and so, you know, three of the things we had, you know, of course, thought about were the Oxen AID system, which utilizes uh, the plant hormone Oxen, 
Um, but unfortunately, this requires the expression of a plant ligase. Um, so has you know potential immunogenicity risks and sort of you know additional complications to the system. There's also halo protex. Um, you know this I think is a great um, is a, is 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 a is a is a great tool. Um, in this case, we were we were concerned that the degrader molecule. Um, well, first the halo protein is um, also a bacterial protein and is very large um, and. You know the molecule would also require a medchem optimization, and then lastly, DTAG, which is also you know of these three, might actually you know be one of the best options, and has actually been put on carts and and uh, by by other groups. Um, and there, you know, this uh, specifically you know binds to F human FKBB twelve with an F thirty six V mutation, but unfortunately, this would also need. Um, would need to be uh, MedCan optimized. Um, so a colleague of mine, Mark Hild, was really inspired by publications, um, you know, a lot of which really came from, from Dana Farber, from, you know, Bill Kalin and Ben Eber, Eric Fisher, Jay Bradner, and Nico Toma, just to mention a few. Um, and, the, you know, this idea to really utilize uh, the, the Degron or the minimal degron from um, from IKZF1 or IKZF3 um, that you know that binds to to the to cerebellum in the presence of an imid and causes degradation of these proteins. Um, and so, in the initial uh, Kronke uh, paper from Ben Ebert's lab, we we were really inspired by you know this this figure uh, shown here, and that potentially we could we could take sort of this minimal degron. And initially, we did test this with. Um, as shown, um, and this is what we ended up using in the paper that is sort of an extension of zinc finger two, a little bit of zinc finger one and zinc finger three, and then also sort of has this, you know, region that's sort of, uh, you know, we'll call an unstructured region outside of um, the, the zinc finger domains. Um, we did actually at some point also, you know, test many variations of this and had, had tested all the way down to sort of the minimal 27 amino acid uh, zinc finger two. Um, but unfortunately, in, in our hands, this actually seemed to decrease the CAR expression a, a little bit more. Um, and so we decided to stick with this because it seemed pretty stable uh, and it seemed to work pretty well in our hands. Um, we could also show that, you know, I, I, you know, as also, you know, Ben Eber and others have shown that when you take this minimal degrad and append it to other proteins, uh, you can degrade those proteins. And so um, you know, in the case of, you know, MITF shown here, uh, we can, and in this case, I should also mention, we modified actually all of the lysines to arginine um, as a, you know, just a really useful tool for being able to look at heterologous protein degradation without, you know, having to worry about lysine on your protein of interest being ubiquitinated uh, or with lysine on the tag being ubiquitinated so that you can really focus on lysines on your proteins of interest. Um, and with the, um, we could rescue this with MG132. Uh, you know, it's a very fast dose responsive, you know, potent um, degradation when you add, in this case, lenalidomide. Uh, we could also show this on um, human NGN2 neurons expressing tau, uh, in this case, a YFP tag tau or a degron with YFP, and you see a really nice dose response. So, you know, it's really nice for, you know, nuclear proteins, cytoplasmic proteins, um, whether short or long half-life, this seems to work pretty well. Um, but in the end, you know, this was really kind of an ideal system for us because it use, utilizes an FDA approved molecule. Um, and we thought it would be ideal to move forward. So we brought this uh, into, you know, this concept of being able to regulate CARTs where we would append the IKZF3 uh, degron in, onto the uh, C terminus of the CD3 zeta domain of a CART such that the CART, when expressed, would be constitutively on. And when you add an imid, you would then. Uh, cause uh, the recruitment of um, of the CAR to cerebellum um, and then the, its subsequent degradation, uh, and in a dose responsive fashion, being able to sort of tune the expression of the of the CAR. Um, so we're, we initially just took this into JERCAT cells, which are just essentially a functional surrogate for T cells, uh, but because they're immortalized, they're just a lot easier to work with. Um, and this way we could do a little more detailed characterization of the system um, before moving into our, you know, the more complicated primary T cells. Um, and we could show that we could, you know, we could demonstrate that we could degrade uh, the degron tag car um, to pretty much undetectable levels by Western blot. 
Um, and this could be rescued with an NA1 inhibitor as well as proteasome inhibitors. Um, but we could not, you know, we were not able to rescue with a lysosome inhibitor. So um, just sort of double checking, you know, this is a cell surface protein. We wanted to ensure this was degrading through uh, the proteasome as expected. Um, we also performed global TMT proteomics, and we demonstrated that the CAR, uh, in this case, CTL-119, um, was highly degraded, even more so than the endogenous um, image neosubstrates like IKZF1, IKZF3, and CK1-alpha. Um, and then lastly, we also really wanted to look at uh, a degradation time course, but not just of total protein. What we're really concerned about is the cell surface um, the cell surface cart expression because this is really the functional uh, the, the functional uh, portion of, uh, of the protein. Um, and so you know we could show that the car was nearly completely degraded within an hour and, and reached a Dmax within four hours uh, by Western blood. But there was a little bit of a, or a significant delay, I guess, um, in the reduction of the cell surface population, which took more like eight to 24 hours to really reach baseline levels. Um, and so interestingly, you know, when we performed a thorough washout, we're also, you know, the car expression actually rebounded incredibly uh, quickly, um, not just on by total protein, but also on the cell surface. And so, you know, while it definitely takes longer to see total degradation of the, the functional pool, uh, it does come back pretty quickly. Um, and so we're pretty, we're pretty excited about this, um, but we then want to just sort of do a few functional tests. Um, and so next we, um, we also sticking with the, the jerk cat cells, we did a, uh, you know, a dose response looking at cell surface and could, you know, calculate a DC 50 of about 28, uh, nanomolar. Um, and then we also use a NFAT, uh, expressing, um, cell line, just sort of as a transcriptional to read out transcriptional activity downstream of car signaling. And in this case, it's a co-culture system where we also co-express uh, or we co-incubate um, the uh, T set, the jerk head cells in the presence of uh, NOM6 cells, which are, or in this case, sorry, uh, yeah, NOM6 cells, which are CD19 positive or K562 cells, which are CD19 negative, just sort of showing that, you know, the, the baseline response of the K562 cells is sort of, this is sort of minimal, the minimal response you would, you would get of the, of the CART cells. Um, but in the presence of CD19 positive NOM6 cells, when you add the, uh, the image, you get a really nice uh, dose responsive effect of loss of, um, loss of NFAT signaling. And this, you know, miraculously actually ended up at an identical um, IC50, SRDC50 of 28 nanomolar. Um, we also, sorry, let's see if I can play a video. Um, we also wanted to look at, uh, you know, whether um, we want to ensure that the, the degron tag cars remain completely functional. So we also just sort of GFP, we had made a GFP degron car, uh, and then we co-cultured these with K562 cells that express an m cherry tag CD19. And this way we could show sort of the functional lysis that these, um, the, the jerk head cells were actually uh, fully competent. Um, and this really made us, you know, excited to move on to, um, to a system um, in, in primary, to take the system into primary T cells. And so we generate, the next step was to really generate uh, carts um, using donor derived primary T cells. Um, and we use the same manufacturing process um, or a very similar manufacturing process to uh, how Camraya is made. Um, and in this case, we, you know, moving into primary T cells, there can be donor to donor variability. So we always maintain at least three donors for every, um, for every experiment. One thing we could demonstrate right away was that lentiviral transduced rate of a car, uh, degron was always very similar, um, to the, uh, the untagged, uh, car, car 19. Um, but interestingly, the mean fluorescence intensity or MFI was always 50% lower pretty much across the board of the degron de de tag cart, which essentially just means that on a per cell basis, the expression level of the car was reduced by about 50%, despite the fact that the same number of cells were infected. Um, but the, I mean, I think the most important part is that we actually, when we added imid, we saw nearly complete loss down to less than 1% of um, expression remaining on the surface. Um, 
And really, you know, I think also despite the difference in a per cell expression, we wanted to see if the cars remained fully functional. And so we performed a very similar experiment to what I showed in the NFAT uh, Jercat cells, in this case, using the, um, the T cells, the, the CARTs um, at various ratios of uh, CART to tumor cell or effector to tumor cell. Um, and the NOM6, uh, and then monitored the NOM6 uh, growth inhibition over time. Um, in this case with, you know, with or without, um, either with or without the Degron and then with the Degron with or without uh, lenalidomide. Um, and so you can see that, you know, the, the carts with the Degrons perform as well at killing tumors as, um, as, as the carts without the Degron. And we can see a pretty, you know, a, a significant window that starts opening up when you start treating with lenalidomide. Um, but we hypothesize that the you know, due to the slow kinetics of degradation compared to the fast rate of CAR um, tumor lysis, that we'd actually need to perform this assay at a lower ratio for a longer period of time, so almost to kind of replicate what we might be doing in vivo later. Um, and so this way we could actually perform more of a tumor uh, regression study where everything's normalized to a four hour time point, And then we can see what's happening to the tumors over time. Um, and here you can really see, you know, the CAR degrons performing as well as the CAR without the degron, but then when you add lenalidomide, you really completely reduce um, the cell's ability to, uh, to lice and kill tumor cells. Um, in that same study, we also um, took supernatants from all of the wells to measure uh, cytokine response. Um, and in a very similar study, we also performed a proliferation assay to look at how these cells proliferate compared to the, you know, the, the tag versus untagged or the degron version of the, of the car versus untagged. Um, and, you know, I think one thing we can show is that, you know, well, you know, there is a, a slight decrease in the amount of interferon gamma and IL-2 uh, that's produced by the carts with the degron there is still a, a, a significant response. And I mean, if, and definitely lenalidomide treatment of the untagged cars um, definitely increases their, um, their cytokine production, which is also not surprising given the immunomodulatory effects of, uh, of IMIDs. Um, but despite that you know, large increase you see in the untagged car, when you add the lenalidomide to, um, to the Degron tag car, you completely, in this case, we abolish cytokine um, production. And uh, in the similar experiment, we also uh, you know, inhibit their proliferation in response to, um, to tumor cells. So the next step was to take, uh, to take these cells in vivo. Um, and so we, we took the, the same exact donors that we'd already validated in vitro, uh, and then just administered, administered them to a non-6 orthotopic xenograft model. Um, in the first experiment, we really wanted to focus on just dosing lenalidomide PO at 30 mg per kilogram uh, twice per day in order to demonstrate that, you know, both the CAR-19 um, CAR and CAR-19 degrom could actually um, uh, regulate tumor, tumor growth. Um, but when we added lenalidomide in this case, um, we also, you know, very similar to in vitro, completely abolished the, um, the CAR-19 degron, um, the activity of the CAR. Uh, and so the tumor is, you know, grow, growing out. Um, we also drew peripheral blood throughout the study. And this way we could demonstrate that the, you know, that I think surprisingly, despite the, pro the in vitro proliferation response, we actually do see that there is, um, there actually is some uh, proliferation of the CAR-19 um, degron cells treated with, with lenalidomide, um, suggesting that you know, perhaps that dosing lenalidomide may not, it may not impact future efficacy if removed. Um, and the removal studies obviously are very complicated in these systems because of the, 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 the rate of growth of, these, of the tumor. Um, so the next thing we wanted to figure out was then actually, could we, what, what happens in a dose escalation study? Like how many carts are required to, to see efficacy with the Degron? Because we did see this decreased expression level of the cart. And one, what we did find was that, um, you know, the, the untagged cart can be, is efficacious. You know, in this case, we only tested as low as two and a half million cells per mice. 
uh, which is very efficacious and it's, it should be efficacious, efficacious even lower than this. But what we found for the CAR-19 Degron is that minimally in order to see efficacy, we needed 5 million um, carts per mouse. Um, and as soon as we went to two and a half, actually, we, at that point, the, you know, they're just not uh, very efficient uh, at regulating tumor growth. And down to one million, they're, they pretty much are the same as, the, as untransduced um, T cells. Um, so we also performed a second study where we could decrease the image dosing to either uh, once per day dosing, or we could actually try to, you know, replicate as best as possible um, you know, what might happen in a, in a patient who receives CARS, um, where if they were, you know, if they had onset of cytokine release syndrome or some, you know, negative effect days later, in this case, we waited five days and then we dosed, dosed lenalidomide. Uh, with QD dosing, you know, we actually start seeing, um, that we can start sort of modulating the activity of the CARS to some extent where we can sort of, you know, suggest that there may be sort of a, tuna, a tunability to the, to the system. Um, and the five day later dosing um, really, I think is, was, was exciting that even after dosing five days, you know, it takes, it takes a little while, but at some point, you know, you actually, you do shut off um, the, the um, activity of the carts and the tumor does start growing back. And so, you know, there's definitely, this suggests that there's, tu there's some tunability here. Um, but of course, the goal of such a therapy wouldn't be to decrease tumor efficacy. It would really just be to reduce uh, the side effects. Um, and so, you know, I think, unfortunately, this is not easy to do in an immune compromised rodent. And so the key would be to identify a dose that allowed efficacy to remain um, while tuning down the activity to reduce the tumor burden and prevent um, in, our, in the case, you know, or, or in the case, case of T cell exhaustion you might want to start dosing really early uh, at the onset of giving the therapy to sort of give the therapy time to, to, um, to, you know, to induce efficacy and maybe to like build a T, a T memory population or prevent the exhaustion and sort of maybe scale back on the use of lenalidomide as a tumor burden reduces. Um, and so, you know, with that, I th I'll um, just sort of summarize. And so, you know, currently, currently uh, the FDA approved CAR toxicities can be mitigated with anti-IL-6 therapies. Um, in order to regulate CARTs for potential future toxicities, we utilized an image inducible off switch based on the IKZF-103 Degron uh, and, and use of imids. Um, the Degron, uh, the degradation of the CART is quick, it's potent and reversible. Uh, and the Degron tag CART can be functionally regulated in a dose responsive fashion. Um, the also, also we can, the clinically achievable imid doses can, can inhibit the CART uh, function in vivo and dosing regimen, uh, regimen studies are required to really determine the possibility of mitigating toxicity with a minimal efficacy losses in the future. Um, with that, I'd just like to thank everybody involved in this project. Um, you know, it's, I, it's, it was, it was a really, you know, great and exciting project and, um, there's so many people uh, that uh, that took part in making this possible. So um, with that, I'll take questions.